we can come together as a family today, Father. Lord, protect this nation. Protect the people in it. Turn our hearts to you. Lord, those that are not saved, Father, turn them to you for salvation through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior on the cross. Father, we love you. We desire for your will to be done in our lives here today. So God, I pray that any and every burden that anyone has carried in this room today would be let go, that they would leave it here today. Father, I pray that I not be seen nor heard today, but that you alone would be seen and heard working in and through me. Lord, may you alone get all of the honor, glory, credit, and praise. We acknowledge that you have all power to do whatever you want to do here within and through us. So we thank you for your great work and that you've called us to be a part of it. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, we rebuke any and every enemy that would try to steal, kill, and destroy. God, may we see clearly. May we receive clearly and freely. May we thank clearly. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He is so worthy. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to pick up this week where we left off last week. If you do not have a Bible, a good study Bible, if you do not have a study Bible at your home, see me before you leave. I want to put one in your hands for free because I believe God wants you to have his word. No strings attached. You don't have to fill anything out. We just want to give you a free study Bible. The words from the text will be on the screen momentarily. Revelation chapter 3. God is good. Amen. God bless you for coming. Revelation 3 1. Let's go. Here's what the Word of God says. Praise the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed, thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want to remind you, because maybe some of you have not been with us over the past few weeks as we've been studying the first two chapters of Revelation together. I want to remind you that uh, to the angel of the church, that is the pastor of the church. Jesus is telling John what to write down. John's in prison on the Isle of Patmos for preaching and administering the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks to, to John. John writes down the letter. The letter goes, goes out to each church. The pastor would verbally, in the assembly of the congregation coming together, read it over his congregation. Then the letter to their church would be re-rolled up, sent on down the street to the next church, and on and on it went to the seven churches. The reason it went to the seven churches is the same reason that it comes to you and I today, because we're to learn from the other church. Amen? We're to learn from the other church. Revelation 3, 1. Let's look at it and study it together by strength from the Holy Spirit. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. Now remember, the congregation is sitting here. This is being read to them, a personal letter from Jesus Christ himself to their congregation. And Jesus says to every one of them, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are what, church? Dead. Now, up until this point, 
every other church has had something positive said to it first. You remember that? Yeah. Every other church. Now, even though they've had something uh, tough to hear, most of them, every church got a thumbs up first, if you will, but not this church, not this particular church. Jesus goes right to the problem, and he says to the entirety of the church, I know your works. Look at your neighbor and say, God knows everything. He knows whether you're doing it with a good heart, whether you're doing it with a heart of legalism. He knows what you're doing and why you're doing it. The Bible says he knows not just your hearts and the thoughts, but he even knows the motives and the intentions of our thoughts. And God is faithful even when we're not. And Jesus says to the church, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now listen to this. Many Christians can become guilty of this. They become guilty of living in their own past rather than living in their present when it comes to acts of service to God within the church. And it's easy, if we're honest with one another, it's easy to do that, especially as one gets older or even as life becomes more busy. But look, if you're living and breathing in here, that's good news because I don't have to do any funerals on Tuesday or Wednesday. But if you're living, no one is giving the rest of your life off from service to God. Amen. No one. Amen. I don't care if you're 90, 100, Amen. 80. I don't care what your situation at home is. Amen. No one is giving off. You say, well, pastor, I've got to do this. I can't. No, 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 no. Don't you tell me that you can't sit at home and make phone calls of encouragement. Amen. Don't you tell me that you can't sit at home and take a moment to text someone some good news of encouragement. Don't you think you're going to make me believe that you can't write a card or send out a letter to someone when you're homebound? I'm not going to believe it. Amen. No one is given the right to just take off. Amen. Now, here's the hard thing about giving a message uh, into your heart, into your ear like this. To the person that's taken off, they've already excused themselves and justified it. So without the Spirit of God piercing your heart, it would be really hard to make you believe that you're the one I'm talking to. Because you've okayed it in your own heart to just take off. Amen. Well, I'm uncomfortable doing this, or well, I have this, or well, I have that. But you didn't take off doing everything else in your life. Amen. You've just taken off the spiritual side, or you've just taken off the service side, or you didn't take off doing the work, or you didn't take off being busy, or you didn't just white out your entire calendar. You know, isn't it something that we're willing to sacrifice the things that we feel can be pushed out, and the things that we feel we have to do, we never sacrifice? You understand? So it doesn't matter what is going on at home. You're never going to convince me that you can't pick the phone up and just call someone to encourage them. Amen. After all, that's all I'm doing to you today. I'm just here encouraging you. Yes. Amen. You understand? I'm just here to encourage you today. I'm here called by God to give you the word that God has called me to preach to you today. Amen. And that's what I'm doing. I'm encouraging you. You understand? I'm giving you the word so that the Holy Spirit can then water what I'm casting out, which is the seed upon your hearts today. You understand? So there is not one person in this room that is given the week off. Amen. You got that? Everybody understand that? Yes. Not one person. I don't care. Look, and I'm saying this with all due respect, because you have to hear this before we press deeper into the problems Amen. that this particular church had in Sardis. With all due respect, no matter what your situation at home is, if you're breathing, you can still be encouraging. Amen. You understand? If you're breathing, you could still be loving. Yes. If you're breathing, you still have the capacity to forgive someone. Yes. You understand? If you're breathing, you still have the opportunity to minister. Yes. And the church in Sardis was guilty of living on their reputation. But see, that's the past. Amen. Reputation is the past. You know, the saying is, what have you done for me what? Lately. Lately. What, what, what have you done today? Okay. What did you do yesterday? Not what have you done last year? Amen. Look, 
I know people that rest on a reputation. Well, I started, the, I started such and such church 15 years ago. I started that church. Hey, that's fine and dandy. What are you doing this week? Amen. Well, I've gone on 50 mission trips. Okay, what are you doing in your town today? Amen. <laughs> What's on your calendar to administer the gospel this week? Yes. Hey, that was great that you've been on 50 mission trips. But at this point, that's in the past. Amen. That's in the past. That's in the past. What are you doing present day in your life? And Jesus just condemns the entire church for living in their past. Amen. Preach it. See, listen, if all we do is stay so wrapped up in our prior testimony, sooner or later we're going to run out of things to talk about. Amen. You understand? Yes. You understand? And you know it. How many of you guys have been talking to somebody and they say, hey, have I ever told you about? And you say, yeah, you have. And then they keep telling you about it. And you're like, oh, my goodness. He done told me this three times. I know this story. It's going to take 10 minutes. <laughs> yep. And you're trying to rush it. You're trying to rush it. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember trying to end it. Yeah, yeah, remember, remember. I found myself finishing the story for someone before. Yeah, and then, 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 done. And they're like, no, yeah, but this, this. I'm like, oh, man. You can only live on it, but so much, you're going to run out of people to tell about it, Amen. and then you got nothing new to say. Amen. The church is guilty of it. You don't think that's a big deal? It must be because Jesus brings it up first thing in the letter. Amen. It's a big deal. Jesus brought it up. Go, go back to verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. Jesus says, I know your works. And you have the reputation of being alive, but you're what? Yeah. See, what you have already accomplished in Christ can easily become a stumbling block of an excuse to not take the time to continue on in service if you're not careful. Amen. A thousand mission trips across the world are great, but what's happening this week? God is not done with you yet. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, he's not done. Not done. Yep. You see, we must keep sharing the word. Keep sharing current testimonies. Keep loving people. Keep forgiving people. Keep encouraging people. All in the great and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The church was guilty of living on its past glory. They were guilty of living on its past splendor, and they were alive in name only. Amen. They were relying on their name only and the reputation thereof. Revelation chapter 3, verse 2, Jesus says to the church, Wake up. Man, can you imagine being the pastor of that church and having to read that to his congregation. And he stands there before them, before the assembly of believers, and he gives this warning for his people to take heed. Wake up. Now the next thing Jesus says comes as both warning and encouragement. Jesus says in verse 2 to the church, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. So that's good news. That's good news that Jesus is saying, wake up, strengthen yourself before you die. I've not found your works complete. Don't focus on what you've done. Focus on what I want you to do. And so that's good news that every one of you in this room too, myself included, Jesus is not done working through us. Can you say amen to that? Jesus Christ has so graciously warned the church, giving them time to repent for their lack of service and obedience unto him. They were failing in their calling that God had placed upon their lives and their ministry. But listen to this. This is how merciful God is. Even in their failure, 
Jesus says, wake up. Even in their shortcomings, even when they fell, Jesus says, not I'm done with you. He says, wake up. I'm not finished with you yet. Your works are not yet complete. And so the call Jesus gives to repentance to the church is the same call today. Wake up, wake up, wake up. God Almighty, the church must wake up. They thought that they were doing good and were only fooling themselves. And Jesus is saying this, snap out of it. So if you're taking notes, two things I want you to write down. First thing, write, wake up. After that, write, snap out of it. I believe that that's a call to the entirety of the church body today. They must wake up. You see, the faithful have stayed awake. There have some and many that have fallen asleep to the call of God. The Holy Spirit gives life to the church. Can you say amen to that? The Holy Spirit gives life to the church. And that is exactly what the church in Sardis needed. They needed to listen and to rely again on the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And maybe, just maybe, you're here today and you feel as though your life is like the church in Sardis. You once felt alive. You once were walking in obedience to God the Father. But lately, for whatever reason, you've been on the sideline in reference to your obedience and your service to God. And the good news is, just like the call to the church of Sardis, You too have the same opportunity today, a call from our Lord to wake up. And I want to encourage you, wake up and begin again to listen and follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Let that be an encouragement to you, friends. Notice, notice the letter to this church is different than the others we've read. There is no mention of any persecution from out the church okay not to this church to the other letters up until recent that we have read that Jesus writes to the, in Revelation to the church through John those churches have been talked about as far as being attacked from the outside this church is having no attacks but yet still they've begun to fall asleep so I want you to think of something They would have been better off suffering persecution because at least then they would not have been lulled to sleep. At least then they'd not have been lulled to sleep. It's no different than the the coming, the return of our Lord, our Messiah. If you think that it's not going to be soon, quick and near, then it's easy to put it off, isn't it? But for the ones that understand it's coming soon, you tend to cross your T's and dot your I's a little quicker, don't you, when it comes to your obedience to the Lord. And so this church had no persecution from the outside, and it has become easy for them not to remain on guard. It has become easy not to follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit, easy not to follow what the Word of God has called them to do. It has become really easy. They were satisfied with their past splendor all the while, listen to this, ignoring the decay from within. They were satisfied. They were satisfied with what they used to do. They were satisfied with the popularity and the fame from the events that they used to have. Listen, you can run a three-ring circus and still not have enough power to raise the dead back to life. You understand that? It's not about events or things. I can't tell you how many times in my life of ministry uh, that people have asked me, oh, when are we going to do this event? When are we going to do that event? You know, we need to know people are here. We need to have this event. We know more people. Listen, the best place that you can get to know people at an event is on a Sunday because there's more of you here on a Sunday than if we had a spaghetti dinner on a Tuesday night. And see, if you, 
If, if, if those types of people were really interested in meeting up with other people, you'd get here early on Sunday and you'd stay late on Sunday. So whatever itch you want me to scratch as your pastor, I'm not doing it. You understand? It's not my job to make you feel good. It's my job to help you live right. You understand that? That's my job. It's not my job to make sure you felt warm and fuzzy when you come here. It's my job to preach what God laid in my spirit to preach to you, and then it's his job of his spirit to work it over on you. And it's either going to make you feel real good, or it's either going to bring conviction to you, where it may hurt at first, but then when you let the spirit manifest the work in you, I promise it will feel good later, as long as you do what the word tells you to do. You understand? And so if it ever hurts, here's good news. If God is the father, we know he is, and he's the doctor, we know he is, just do what the doctor prescribed, and that's his word. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. See, we can't be so happy about the outside pleasure that the inside starts to decay. Now, I'm just going to get a little personal with you. You know I don't mind doing that with my personal life. I've got a tooth. It doesn't hurt. I think the dentist just wants my money. <laughs> but for years, for years he's been telling me, there's a cavity in that tooth. And I said, nope, I don't feel it. We ain't messing with it. He says, but I'm telling you, you've got a cavity in that tooth. I said, nope, we ain't messing with it. I'll go back uh, six months later, whatever it is. He said, hey, that cavity's still in your tooth. I said, has it grown? He said, no. I said, well, we ain't messing with it. So the dental assistant or whatever, she tells me another year later, she said, the cavity is still there. And uh, I said, has it grown? She said, uh, she says, well, I don't know. We can put the machine on it. We'll tell. And I said, well, what's the number? Before you hit it with that machine, what's the number that it has to be fixed at? And she gave me the number. And I said, okay, then we'll go wait for that number. Let's see what it is. And she scans it. She puts the thing on there. She scans it. And it was like 0. .2 under the number. I said, see, I ain't there yet. <laughs> I'm not there yet. The dentist comes in. This is no joke. We go through this every time I go to the dentist. They check this tooth. For years, the cavity has not grown. And they ain't had to drill my tooth. I still got my tooth. It don't hurt. It don't hurt. They keep telling me, hey, that thing, that thing is, 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 is bad. I said, no, it ain't. It still works. And if you wouldn't have said it was bad, I wouldn't even known it was bad. It ain't bad. Amen. Now, here's why it has not grown. This is the truth. Not exaggerating, it's true. Here's why it hadn't grown. Because I don't like the dentist, and I don't like needles. I don't like people in my mouth. Makes me uncomfortable. So when they told me the first time, hey, you got a cavity, I said, now this has been years ago, I said, what do I have to do to keep it from getting worse? And they said, keep it clean. You wouldn't have had it to begin with. So I said, okay, I'm going to keep that tooth clean. If, if I don't floss nothing else, that tooth is going to get hit and worked on. See, it has not furthered three years later in decay because I've done a good job of making sure they ain't going to get no needle in my gums. Now, the church is the same way. We must do a good job making sure Satan doesn't get a foot in the door, Amen. not a toe in the door. Look, do we have problems? Look at the person sitting next to you. Of course we got problems. <laughs> of course we've got some issues. But here's the good news. None that the Spirit of God can't handle. And rather than let the issues fester and explode, we take care of them. Amen. You understand? Yep. Look at your neighbor and say we're supposed to love each other. Yep. See, we... We shouldn't rely on the fact that we used to love each other. We should be loving each other now, Amen. today. See, you got to look at it like that. The church in Sardis was guilty of that. Well, we did this together back then. We're still okay today. No, that's not how it works. See, that's even how marriages fail. You rely on what you did together 10 years ago. You got nothing today. You got nothing today. And so, yeah, you can raise 15 children together, but if you don't spend time with each other, at the end of all those years, you look at each other and say, who are you? Amen. Well, I know who my 15 children are, but I don't know who the woman is I've been laying beside for those 15 years. 
What do we do together now? You can't rely on past history in your physical life. Why would we do it in our spiritual life? I'll tell you why. Because it's so easy to put God and his word back on the shelf. See, but you can't put your spouse on the shelf. They'll throw the shelf at you. And so it becomes really easy. It becomes really easy to leave your house and not open the Bible. But you leave your house and not at least say bye to your spouse. You go regret it when you come home that afternoon. Amen. And we've all been there. You got in a spat, you leave. You know the right thing to do is say bye, you, I love you. You walk out of the house or maybe you do one of Bye. Didn't even say you love each other. Bye. All day, you know, oh my goodness, I've got to reap that seed I sowed. It'll mess your whole work day up, don't it? Amen. It'll mess the whole work day. And what did you prove? See, listen, it's so easy. It is so easy to put God on the shelf. But let me tell you how it becomes difficult to put God on the shelf. Amen. Yes, God. When you spend time with God the way you spend time with your spouse, then all of a sudden you hear the voice of God in your ear the same way you hear your spouse's voice in your ear. See, when you spend time with your spouse and you know, oh, I heard her, that was the wrong thing. It's going to mess my whole day up today and I'm going to have to deal with it tonight when I get home. When you spend time with God that way and then you reject him by not spending time in the morning, all day you feel that conviction. Oh, Lord, I shouldn't have done you like that. I should have spoke to you before I left the house this morning. I should have spent time with you. Should have told you I love you, Lord. It's going on lunch, and I hadn't even told you I love you yet. See, if we would, if we would treat God the way we treat other people, oh, I'm telling you, we would go from faith to faith, wouldn't we? And so the church in Sardis is guilty of not spending quality time with God. Question for you today. I don't want you to answer out loud. God knows you. He can hear you. But just between you and the Lord, I want to ask you this question. Who will you be today? How will you allow God to use you today? I'm not concerned about what you did for him yesterday or last week or last year. See, even as a coach, I can be guilty of living on prior memories of victories. But the only victory that matters is the game that we play today. Look at verse 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. You know what, I feel like the Lord wants me to say this. Uh, there's, a, there's a man on this side of the room, and he just wants you to be encouraged in your marriage. Uh, you've, you've been stressed out, you've been frustrated, looking at how in the past you've been a good husband. But the word of encouragement, brother, for you today is uh, focus on being a good husband today. And everything else will be okay. God is good. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus says to the church, he says, Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. Hmm. If you're struggling today, I want to encourage you in the Lord. With all that you've received from God, all of the times you felt him at work in your life, all of the times that you've seen the hand of God working in you and through you and around you, all of the teaching that you've received and the things that his Holy Spirit has so graciously taught you, keep it and repent. Do not forget what God has done. If you found yourself in a rut, Bring back to memory those things. Get back to your roots. Get back to your first love again with Christ. 
And so Revelation 3.3 3 again says this, Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up. Now, this is where the letter, if it wasn't already serious enough, gets really placed in their face. Because again, there's been no encouragement to the church yet, like his other letters to the churches. He came right out and just gave it to them right in their nose. And then if it couldn't have got any harder on their ears, here comes this. If you will not wake up, verse 3, Jesus says, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Wow. Now hopefully no one in here, I know I haven't, but hopefully no one in here has ever done something so bad that your wife had to show up at the job. If you have, God bless you. Now, I've seen it before where I used to work and every man on location just kind of went, ooh. You talk about the C parting. Every man just did not want to be a part of it and out of respect for that guy. It was so funny. I mean, it wasn't even, it just walked out of there. It's just kind of like duck and run, brothers, duck and run. Jesus just said, if you can't wake up and get this straight, I'm going to show up. He said, you won't even. Listen now, this is what he's telling the church. This is what he's talking to the church. Listen, Jesus takes his children very seriously. The Bible doesn't say that he's jealous of us. It does say that he's jealous for us us. And I thank my God that he loves you and I so much that he don't want no enemy laying a finger on us. And so when we've bought into a way of the world, he gets serious about it. And he says, if you don't wake up, I'm coming and I'm not even going to come with a warning. This is your warning. The next time you see me, he says, the next time you see me, it'll be like a thief shows up in the night. I don't know if you've ever read it like that, but that's how he said it. Amen. See, he first, he already gave the warning in the beginning of the letter. He said, wake up. That's right. Have you ever told your children, this is your last chance? Raise your hand. Amen. Look around the room. Yes. This is it. <laughs> you ever told them, this is your last warning. This is it. Amen. See, here's the difference between you and me and Jesus. When Jesus says it, he means it. Amen. Preach it. Preach it. He means it. Yes, he does. He means it. There's some people in his in this room that we say it and we mean it, but then there's other times we say it and we're like, I don't even feel like getting out this chair. <laughs> you go to your room. <laughs> Y'all make me tired. But let me just tell you about Jesus. He said it. He meant it. Amen. You say, yeah, but, but, but pastor, he's got mercy. He's got grace. No, no, no. no. Don't miss judgment. Amen. Don't mix up mercy and grace and wash out judgment. No, th- th- this is a warning for judgment. Amen. This is a warning for judgment to the yes. church. Yes. Jesus is upset yes. that they have allowed themselves to be lulled to sleep and Jesus says wake up and so there's the mercy if you're looking for mercy there it is right there he already gave it to him again 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 and now Jesus says I've had enough and if y'all can't remember what you had and get it back together he says I'm coming to you like a thief in the middle of the night in other words you've been warned this time but the next time I come it's just going to hurt. Amen. Let me give you a perfect example that we could understand in the flesh. Have you ever snuck up behind one of your children? They didn't know you was coming, but you had had enough. Amen. Yeah. You had had enough. Amen. 
because if they knew you were coming, they'd have braced for impact. I'm smarter than that. I have before in my life acted like everything was okay. Just getting up. Give it a few minutes so they forget what they're going through. Amen. Let them get off guard. Let me teach you something. Let them get off guard. Yeah. You just get up and you start smiling as you're walking into the kitchen. Anybody ever received one of those before? Yes. Grown people? Yes. Grown people? Amen. Jesus just told the church, this is what he's saying. You won't even be able to brace for the impact. Amen. Now, I'm not going to take anything out of text. We're going to go back to the word, and we're going to see what the word says. Look at verse 3. Jesus says to the church, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. Listen, that's not an option. That's a command. Amen. That's a command. He has warned the church and he has commanded the church. Remember what I taught you. Keep it and repent from your wicked ways. Amen. He's commanded the church that. And then Jesus says this. If you will not wake up. Now remember, in verse 2, he already gave them mercy and grace and he warned them to wake up in verse 2. Amen. And Jesus says this in the third verse. If you will not wake up. I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Amen. Now that we've had a little history on the message to the church in Sardis, I don't know about you, but that's enough to scare me straight. Yes. But listen to this and take encouragement to this. Jesus has already warned the entire body of Christ that at any moment he could return. Amen. Preach it. We, we've already been warned that he's going to come like a thief in the night. Amen. So remember, don't forget that. Amen. Don't forget that. That at any moment Jesus could come and take the entire church that's faithful without spot, wrinkle, or blemish at any moment. Bam! And we're out of here. Amen. Just like that. Bam! And we're gone. Amen. Verse 4. Yet, you still have a few names in Sardis. People who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are what church? Worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you ever considered that, that Jesus is going to confess your name before his Father and the angels in heaven? Anybody in here waiting to hear a well done, thy good and faithful servant? I want to encourage you in love. Don't let your well done had been 30 years ago. Don't let that be your well done. Don't let your faithfulness had been five years ago. Don't let it be it. Don't rely on that. God and his spirit is willing through his power, not yours. Amen. You may say, Pastor, I'm tired and old. You have no clue. No, 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 no. Don't rely on your own power. Amen. Don't rely on your own, your own strength. You see, when something is alive, now I want to talk about the church. Let's talk about the church for a moment. When something is alive, there should be growth. You say amen to that? When something is alive, there should be growth and, and there should be reproduction. Yes. Talking about the church. And if these two are missing in a ministry, if a ministry does not have growth and if a ministry does not have reproduction, then the church is one of two things. It's already dead or it's in the process of becoming dead. 
And so if the church is not growing, if the church is not reproducing in number, then the church is dead or dying. Amen. And that is never to be celebrated. Never. I know someone personally, a friend of mine. She goes to a church that has 15 people. And myself and other people have tried to encourage her. It's time to move on, time to move on. She says, no, 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 I'm happy with the 14, 15 people in my church. I'm like, whoa, why? Well, we meet every other week. And it's just really easy, not very stressful. I don't feel like I have to talk to everybody there. Um, you know, we, just, we just show up every other week and no outreach, so it doesn't involve me during the week. And that church is already dead. Amen. Another friend I've seen in Food Lion, she lives in Amelia. Hadn't seen her in a while, and I asked her, I said, Sister, where are you going to church? Oh, I go all the way. I go to this church down there in Chesterfield. I said, oh, that's great, that's great. The Lord called you there? No, not really. It's just a really big church, a couple thousand people. I just go there because nobody knows me. I thought there was more wisdom in this individual. I said, because nobody knows you. She says, yeah, yeah, it's really nice. I get up, I go to the early service, nobody knows me, and since they don't know me, they don't ever ask me to do anything, and I leave before they get to know me. Yeah. See, listen, let me, just, let me just encourage you. As your pastor, I don't ever want Christ Family Outreach just to be the one place that you come to just hear the word. If you're coming just to hear the word, you're failing yourself and your family. Amen. Preach it. You understand? Yes. Now, you should come to a church because of the word that is given. Amen. Absolutely. Yes. But when you find your home church because of the word that is given, you should then purposely seek to get plugged into the house. Amen. You understand? You should then, perf listen, it'd be no different than all, if all you did was come home to eat. The other people in your home might have something to say about that. Amen. You don't cut the grass. You don't weed eat. Uh, there's laundry to be done. There's children to help be reared and raised. And, you know, there's a driveway to take care of. There's oil to be changed into vehicles and into farm equipment. And uh, the house needs painting inside and out. And on and, down the, on and down the road we can go. Imagine if all you did was come home to eat. And then you left. See, that's not how God meant to run the house. Amen. Preacher. And God did not intend for the house of God to be run that way either. Amen. See, what God wants, let me tell you, can I tell you what God wants? What God wants is for the people, that's you and I, to come in. He feeds us. Okay, so he feeds me, he feeds you, he feeds us. And then what we have feasted upon, his word, we go out and we give it. Now, there's something else that God gives us in this house. And if you're not getting it in here, you're failing yourself and your family. When you come in here, God gives you fellowship of other saints. Amen. That's the people from that wall to that wall, from that wall to that wall. You understand? God gives you the opportunity to commune with one another. Amen. If you're not taking advantage of that, you're missing it. So that would be like this. That would be like you going and pulling up to your dining room table, eating the meal that has been prepared for you, not looking at your spouse or your children or your parents or your guests at the Amen. table, eating picking up and leaving. Amen. You benefited from the meat that was on the table, but failed to produce in the fellowship. Amen. You hurt yourself. Yes. Amen. You didn't get to know your children. You didn't get to know your spouse and what she went through for the day or what he went through for the day. You didn't get to know your guests that were over, that you were entertaining, however the situation or circumstance may be. You ate, you picked up, you moved on. Don't let church be that. Now, let me encourage you in love. If that's all you're doing, then you're pleasing the enemy. Amen. You say, Pastor, prove it. Give me five seconds. It's really easy. The devil don't want you to know nobody in here. Amen. 
He don't want you to have somebody that you can call on over here for prayer. He don't want you to have somebody that can check on you when you don't look good. He don't want you to have somebody that you can confide in. He doesn't want you to have somebody that you can look at and say, Amen, and admonish in the Lord. He doesn't want you to have someone that you can exalt and praise God. He doesn't want you to know someone that you can give a testimony to. He doesn't want you to know one that can give you their testimony. He doesn't want you to be able to rejoice and be in fellowship and communion and unity with one another. He does not want you to know the names of brothers and sisters in this house. And if all you want to do is come in and get fed, the enemy's happy with that. He's happy with that. He'd rather you come into church and not grow. Amen. Listen to me now. He'd rather you come into the church and not grow. You say, Pastor, prove that. Give me five seconds. Jesus is upset, not of the attendance of Sardis. He was upset that their attendance was great and they did nothing with it. Amen. Preach it. Yes. Yes. Their attendance was great yes. and they did nothing with it. Pastor, how do you know their attendance was great? Because they were living on their past name. Yes. They did something. They were doing something, but then they stopped. And he said, I know your works, but you're now dead. Amen. Listen, when it comes to your faith, don't be a dead man walking. Don't be a dead man walking. Your lives of your children are at stake. Uh, your spouse are at stake. Don't be a dead man walking in your home when it comes to the faith that you have of Christ working and living in you. Amen. Almost the whole church had become dead. And Jesus says this. Look at it. Verse 4, Jesus says, now remember, the pastor is reading this over these people in the church, and Jesus says this, yet you have still a few names who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are what? Really? Look at your neighbor and say, don't quit fighting. Don't quit fighting. No. I don't know about you, but if I, if I was in that church... And that just got read over me, I'd be like this. Yes. Amen. Has your spouse ever got a tail whooping? Or not your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you wanted to. Maybe you wanted to. He he deserves one right now. Has your children ever got a tail whooping? Has your brother or sister ever got one and you were glad that you got away from one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I've said it before, but it fits, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, one of my clearest memories in my life was when my brother and I got involved in something that we shouldn't have been getting involved in at a young age, and my dad called us downstairs into his room. Well, that won't ever good because their rooms was off limits, so if you ever got invited into the office... So my brother, my brother was a lot more hard-headed than I was. And he was a lot tougher than I was uh, at that time in life. And so he stepped up to get his spanking first. And I graciously said, go ahead, please. <laughs> and my, my, my parents did not abuse us at all. They reared us right. They reared us enough to make us fear messing up. That was a good thing. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. And so my dad is spanking my brother, and my brother turns around and starts laughing. Ha, ha, ha! Well, I'm standing there watching this. I'm like, oh, no, man, I'm next. Come on, man, don't tick them off. So my dad looks at my brother and says, do you think that's funny? And my brother does this. Yep. So my dad teaches them what's not funny. Amen. I'm looking at my brother because I don't think none of it's funny. Because I'm not exaggerating. This is the truth. I'm next. <laughs> my brother's eyes start welling up with tears. And a couple fall down his face. And my brother does this. Ha, ha, ha! So me... Being next in line says this. 
My brother's name is Adam. Come on, Adam, stop! Stop! My dad looks at me and my brother, and it was then I realized my dad had wore himself out. Yes. <laughs> and my dad looks at me and says, y'all both go to your room. Yes, sir! <laughs> my brother went upstairs red and sore. I went upstairs happy and shiny. Man, you can go first from now on, bro. <laughs> now, I say that to say this. Those people in the church of Sardis that had just been warned very sternly, that whole church, that whole church took the same warning that everybody else did. Amen. Remember what I've done. Wake up. Repent. Or I'll come at you like a thief in the night that you didn't know was coming. Amen. They had to sit through all that. But then all of a sudden, in the next verse, Jesus says this, but there's some of you. And look, I don't know about you, but they had to go, yes. Yes, he sees me. Yes, he does know me. Yes, he sees my heart. He knows I've been trying. Even when my brothers and sisters beside me have been failing God, they've been failing me. They've been failing the pastor. They've been failing the church. They've been failing the ministry. They've been failing one another. They've been failing the community. My Lord has seen that I've tried. He says, but there's some of you in Sardis whose names I will not blot out. Hallelujah. Their garments have not yet been soiled. Now, I want to encourage you if, you, if you feel like that, if you feel like that, be encouraged. Because what it means is this, by their garments not being soiled, it means that they have not fallen to the works of idolatry, adultery, or wicked sins within the church. He said, their garments have not been soiled. They're still white, and they will be white with me on that day. And they will walk in glory, and I will not blot their names out of the book of life. Wow. Let that be an encouragement to you today. Let that encourage you that when times get hard and you feel like you're the only one at your job taking a stand, when you feel like you're the only one at the family reunion taking a stand, don't forget what that scripture says when God is speaking in 1 Samuel 2.30. If you honor me, God says, I will honor you. And let me just tell you, I know that to be true. I know that if you're willing to stand up and honor the Father, he will show honor to you. Anybody in here agree with that? Can we give God a clap of praise for that? God is faithful. Now, because Brother Kyle said that I could preach till 4 today, 4.30, thank you, we're, we're not done, we're going to go into the next letter. It's only 11.43. And the Bible says this, to the church in Philadelphia, hmm, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. And I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Now, see, let me just tell you this. Now, the world is going to know that you were right. Amen. Your family is going to know that you were right. Amen. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. You understand? The yeah. people that have said you are crazy, yeah. the people that said you are a religious nut yeah. or fanatic, or crazy. Listen, they're going to know that you were right. Every one of them, the Bible says, there's coming a day where their knee is going to bow and their tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so every one of them will know. Stay faithful. Verse 10, 
because you have kept my word about patient endurance, and I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, Spirit of God, says to the churches. Now, write this down if you're taking notes. Philadelphia means love of the brethren. Love of the brethren. Listen, church, loving just the brethren is not enough. Amen. I want you to understand that very clearly today. Yeah. Loving just the brethren is not enough. Amen. If all you do is love the saved people, you fail. Amen. If all you do is love Christians, you've failed. Amen. We must daily love the unchurched. Amen. We must daily love the unsaved. Those who are living the way we once lived before we came to know Jesus Christ as Messiah, Redeemer, Lord, and Savior. But if all we do is love the people in these walls and the walls at home, we've failed drastically. Jesus introduced himself in this letter as the Holy One, the True One. Now I want you to write that down. Holy One. The true one. This is how Jesus introduces himself to the church of Philadelphia. The church in Philadelphia was situated in a very busy place, loaded. It was loaded with temples to false gods. It too was another military town. And Jesus is reminding the church, I am the holy one. I am the true God. Now, I think this is beautiful because, again, there's so many false temples around the church of Philadelphia. Jesus is encouraging the church. He says, I'm it. I'm it. First, last, beginning, end, alpha, omega, I'm it. And so in the opening of this letter, it's beautiful because he's encouraging the church at Philadelphia. I am the Holy One. I am the true God. Stay the course. Look at your neighbor and say, stay the course. course. Steadfast, remain steadfast. Look at verse 8, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come down and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Stop right there for a moment. In the New Testament, when you read the term open door, the majority of the time it speaks of opportunity for ministry. You're going to find that everywhere in the New Testament. The majority of the time when you read that term open door. So if you're taking notes, jot that down, two words, open door. And then beside the words open door, I want you to write opportunity for ministry. Opportunity for ministry. That's very important because some of you today, when you go to food line, when you leave here, are going to see an open door. That's your opportunity for ministry. Some of you, when you're at the gas pumps, there will be an open door. That's your opportunity for ministry. Some of you, when you go home, there's going to be an opportunity for ministry through an open door. You understand? Opportunity for ministry. Jesus gave the church a great opportunity of ministry. But understand, where God gives great opportunity, the devil can also put up a great fight. And so when Satan sees God doing great things, the devil gets very upset about it. Even with great opportunity the church had two obstacles to overcome number one they lacked in their own strength Jesus said that they lacked in their own strength Jesus said in in the scripture he said they had little power see this was not a large church 
However, it was a faithful church. Now, I want you to hear that. It was not a large church, but it was absolutely a faithful church. I don't know about you, but I would rather have 15 faithful members than a church of 5,000 bench warmers. You understand? Give me 15 faithful over 15,000 bench warmers any day of the week. Any day of the week. It's not the size of the church that determines the ministry. Amen. If you're taking notes, jot that down. It's not the size of the church that determines the ministry. It's not the size of the church that determines the ministry. But understand this, a healthy ministry will end up growing. Yes. You understand? Amen. You understand? A healthy ministry will end up growing. Yes. Number two. The church had opposition, according from Jesus in the text, the church had opposition from others that were living around and living among them. This was an attack on the church from Satan himself. Amen. Now listen to this. People around you are not always going to love you. Amen. You understand? Yeah. People around you are not always going to love you. Look at the 10th verse, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because you have kept my word yeah. about patient endurance. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know about you, but maybe the Lord has called you to be patient and endure before. Yeah. According to this, he has already done that. He has already done that. He has already done that to the church in Philadelphia. So look at the 10th verse. Because... You have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I hold fast what you have. You know, let me just give you something to be able to, to, to push back on people when they say, yeah, Jesus is always saying that he's coming back. Anybody ever said that to you before? Yes. Amen. You want a you good response in faith to them through testimony? Say, well, let me tell you what. He showed up for me last week. I do know that. Yes. And let me tell you what he did for me, too. Amen. Let me tell you what he did for me, too. Amen. You see, I was in this pickle of a situation and boom 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 yes. I mean what a way to show your faith in Jesus Christ yes. hey, hey I know I know uh, uh, Pastor Lee you keep telling me that Jesus is coming and I no, no, no he's already been here Amen. you know what I'm saying matter of fact the Spirit of God showed up in worship this morning see this is what the, this is what the church needs to get back to because this is what the unchurched this is what the unsaved doesn't understand my God is not a stranger to me I'm not looking for someone that I haven't already seen, y'all. <laughs> now, now maybe, maybe if your faith is not mature, if you're still on meat and milk and not in meat, or maybe if you are in meat and, you've never, and, and you are mature in the faith and maybe you haven't ever seen this, I don't know, but let me encourage you. You shouldn't, be, look, if you've got a relationship with Christ, you shouldn't be thinking that you're looking for someone that you've never met. Amen. I, got, I got invited to go share the testimony of our church to a pastor whose church was potentially on the border of staying where they were or breaking through just just a couple years ago so i go down and i meet this guy in a little uh bread shop coffee shop type deal and um i go in i don't know what this guy looks like i just know his name so i go in i know his name and i'm like great he ain't gonna have no name tag on how am i gonna know what so there's two guys just in here looking for each other, you know. And that's how we figured out who one another were. We were the only two nuts standing there. Just... <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, 10 a.m. That's the time, and there's only two guys standing here by themselves. And the guy actually says, hey, are you Pastor Day? And I said, yeah, I am. Are you Pastor so-and-so? He says, yeah, I am. I said, cool, let's talk. See, I think the sad thing is, is that we got some people 
that are like that in their faith. Amen. They know his name is Jesus. They know he's coming to do something, yes. but they don't know who to expect, what he is, what he does, what he thinks, how he talks, yeah. what he sounds like when he talks, or what he looks like. Yeah. And so really, we're just, we're just waiting like I was in that coffee shop for somebody to show up and say, you're so-and-so. I'm not bragging or boasting because everyone, if you're not at this level, could be at this level. Amen. When my Lord returns, I'm not going to be surprised and I'm not saying I know everything about them. I don't. I don't have the capacity to get anywhere close. But I do know some major things about them yes. that when he comes, I'm going to be able to identify him. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to be able to identify him. And the spirit that's in me and the spirit that is him will, yes, that's right. So, as believers, we should see the hand of our God every day. All the time. Why? Because we should be talking with him every day. All the time. We should be listening to him every day. We should be expecting to see him every day. When you wake up tomorrow morning, you're going to expect to see people that live in your home come through the home, aren't you? And it shouldn't surprise you, even if they sleep till 1130 in the morning, Well, there she is, or there he is, or there he goes. But listen, if everyone had left your home and you figured you've got it all to yourself and then you hear something moving, you'd be a little edge, wouldn't you? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, one of your friend's buddies, maybe he came over last night and the two of them, two buds, and they're playing game system all night and you didn't know it. And you're just sitting in your living room think you've got the kingdom to yourself. And all of a sudden, here comes crazy Larry <laughs> through your living room. Hey, Mr. Mitchell, I'm hungry. You got breakfast in the fridge? Now, that used to happen to my parents all the time. <laughs> they will tell you. Happened so much that finally one day my dad said, son, we got to have a talk. I said, I'm like, oh, no, what did I do now? You know, I'm too big for spankings, but I'm big enough for him to kick me out of his house. I said, what's going on? He said, man, I know you love your friends, man, but they can't keep spending the night over here. I'm like, Pop, what's going on? He's like, y'all are grown men, son. <laughs> yeah, but, Dad, we're in ministry, and we were. We were in ministry together. We were going into jails and prisons, and we were doing all types of things. And he's like, son, when your mama and I wake up, and we go in there with our first cup of coffee, and we're still in our PJs, and all of a sudden you got three grown men come out of the bedroom. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we crash on the couch, and your mother comes in there to sit down, and there's a man on the sofa. Like, come on, man. Yeah. See, they were caught off guard because they didn't. Now, thank God they knew their names, but they didn't know they were coming. The church cannot be like that. Amen. This is why the Bible tells us to look up, yes. to look up, yes. to look up. Why else would you look up? Because you're expecting something to take place in the eastern sky. And so we're not supposed to be caught off guard. Good gracious. We are giving a warning. No one in this room will be able to say, oops, there he went. I didn't know. It says in the 11th verse, Jesus says to the church, he says, I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Remember, Jesus said that the enemy, Satan, is out there to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Amen. Now, the crown that we have, the crowns that we will have, and the different types of jewels and rubies and things that will be placed in them, I talked about it a few weeks ago, but what it's referencing to in, partly, in part there, 
the crown that we're going to receive when we get into heaven for everything that we do on this earth that will be represented in ministry towards him. It will be represented in the crown. And when you get the crown, it doesn't belong on your head because we're not worthy to keep it. Now, if we could do it under our own strength, we'd be worthy to keep our crown. But here's the beauty of it. We cannot do true ministry without the Spirit of God working. Can amen. you say amen to that? And so we didn't earn the crown amen. in our own strength. And so the Bible says that when we receive our crown, we are going to take it and we are going to cast it unto the feet of the Lord. Amen. It's His, y'all. It's His. It's His. It's His. Tell your neighbor, that's not mine. Verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Now let me tell you something. We're his. Amen. We're his. When you see your children, hopefully you see them as yours. Yes. Amen? Amen? Amen. Do you remember when that first thing was born? Oh, you pulled it in tight. Yes. You loved that thing. You squeezed that thing. You carried it for as long as you could carry it. Uh -huh. It was yours. Amen. No one was taking it. No. That was yours. Amen. That was yours. Again, I remind you, God is not jealous of us. He's jealous for us. Amen. We're his, y'all. Yes, We're his. Yes, and his name will be on us. And the name of the new kingdom yes. shall be upon us. Yes. Why? Because we are citizens of it. Right. Why? Because we belong in it. Why? Because we are heirs with Christ. Yes. And what's his is now ours. Then look at the closing of the verse. The closing of the letter. Verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I tell you what, out of all the letters that we've studied, and we've only got one left, we'll get into it next week. But out of all the letters that we've studied, most of them, except for one, has some positives. But I really would have loved to have been a part of the church in Philadelphia. Here's the good news, though. Every one of you, at least for today, because maybe some people are visitors, but for those that consider this home, you are part of Christ Family Outreach Church. And God is expecting every one of us and holding every one of us accountable as the members, the body of Christ Family Outreach Church. He's holding us accountable to two things. Obedience and service. Obedience and service. Let's stand and pray. Close your eyes for a moment. I'm, I'm going to read something over you that I would like to bring up. And I want you to just think about it with any, without any distractions. Jesus just gave three promises to the church in Philadelphia. Number one, Jesus said that he would take care of their enemies. God will do the same for you. Number two, Jesus said he would keep them from tribulation. He would keep them from tribulation. And number three, Jesus said that God his Father would honor them. Just like the church in Philadelphia, today every ministry stands before doors in their life. Some already open, some already closed. Some opening while others are closing. God Almighty is looking for our obedience in the situation and it is He, it is He who gives us the power to walk through every door. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you 
as we already have this morning, in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior. Father, I ask that we would continue to be taught by your Holy Spirit, continue to minister to us as today goes on. God, we talk about many things through these two letters, discipline, we've talked about victory, we've talked about not living on past victories, but living on present victories, we've talked about not decaying from the inside. We talked about the purpose of being faithful. We talked about the purpose of a ministry that is alive should be growing and reproducing. God, I pray that you would continue to teach us what this church needs so that we would not only become stronger within these walls, but we would become stronger here so that we can go out and help others become strong. So teach us, teach us your ways, give us your wisdom from your Holy Spirit. If there's anyone in this room that has not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you. Jesus died for you. He hung on that cross for you. And he paid it all and laid it all down for you. And if you bought into the lie that you need to get right first so that you can receive Christ, you'll never get right unless you have Christ. But Jesus is the only way to the Father for all of eternity. I'm thankful that his blood that he shed on that cross and the stripes that he bore are for me and for every one of you in this room. And no matter what you've done, friends, no matter what you've done, the blood of Jesus washes you, the blood of Jesus covers you, and the stripes of Christ heals you. And if today is your day to receive Him as Lord and Savior, if you're ready to surrender to Him and begin a new journey with Him, I'd invite you right where you are to say a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, and I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Save my soul. I recognize that you died on the cross so that I could be forgiven. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name and blood, I ask these things. Amen. Father, bless us in our coming and going. Give us the words to speak to those that are found and those that are not yet found. Words of encouragement and love. In Jesus' name and blood, everybody said... Amen. Help us to see clearly. God bless you. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. God is good.